There we go, there's the title. This thing back here says, this sentence has no vowels. Oh, there's a, yeah, that's how I spelled it right. That's what it says. Okay, uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, sort of starting with uh, sort of topological codes and then talking about uh, subsystem codes and sort of about why we care about them, a little bit about operator, quantum error correction, etc. cetera. Uh, and so uh, off we go. Here are some pictures from, so I know at least three of my pictures are going to show up, which is good. Okay, so it's always nice to be back in Los Angeles. I'm always surprised when I come flying in on the plane to remember that there are mountains in Los Angeles. And then I start thinking, I remember why are, do I not remember mountains? And then I remember why I don't remember mountains in Los Angeles. Of course, to be fair, in Seattle we have beautiful mountains as well. But of course, in Seattle, we don't see them either. So, okay, so off. So, uh, I wanted to sort of give a, a tutorial which had at least some motivating theme and that hopefully would motivate uh, coming into the next uh, tutorial which would talk about uh, experiments and quantum error correction. And uh, I put up here three Nobel Prizes, uh, 1956, 2000, and 2007. And these were for the invention of the transistor, uh, the integrated circuit, and then uh, the one just recently, giant magneto resistance. And in looking at all these, what, what I think is interesting is uh, all of these are really about, in some sense, about error correction and about why we can build systems that robustly compute, okay? And uh, I think we oftentimes forget when we're doing quantum error correction because there's a very beautiful, elegant theory that we can just think about error correction for its own sake and that there's something to be said for that. But there's also something to be said for really thinking about how are we going to build, you know, what is the picture going to look like when we talk about a quantum computer, uh, you know, and they, they put up, you know, 50 years from now, their first picture of a transistor of the quantum version of it. What will it look like, right? What is the physical system? that's going to be used in it, and, uh, and sort of why is it going to work at all? So the basic uh, starting point then is, you know, uh, can we make physical systems which robustly quantum compute? And of course we know the answer to this, right? Or at least we think we know the answer to this. Uh, and this is our uh, panacea, this is the threshold theorem. Uh, and uh, as Daniel said in the first tutorial, uh, you know, it's basically a, 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 a seminal result which, which tells us that we can do uh, quantum computation if noise is weak enough and control is precise enough and the, these are of the correct form. So let me move this out of here. Uh, the correct form. Uh, so, you know, if that's true, then, then we can perform uh, a quantum computation with uh, some, some error uh, and an overhead which is just a uh, polynomial and log of, of, say, one over that error, okay? So this is not a horrible scaling. Now, in real life, it might be a fairly horrible uh, scaling, but, uh, but this at least tells us that there's some hope, right? So there is some nice island, uh, you know, the, there's Hawaii of quantum computing over here, if we can get there. And uh, this is, you know, the most important thing because it tells us in some sense that the model of quantum computation really is a real model of computation. And not, you know, without this, it's really hard to even talk about quantum computing as a sort of valid model of quantum computing, except in the sense that a mathematician will call something a model. So, you know, and that's dangerous. So, uh, but, but what I want to say is, okay, well, that's, that's sort of one approach, but uh, there's also the question of, you know, can you really build a physical device that does this? And here's a picture of Alexei Kataev, who's answering this with the word physics, 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 which is an interesting topic. Some of you may have heard the talk, chicken, chicken, chicken. It's a different talk. Um, so, so Kataev uh, had a very interesting idea right after uh, quantum error correction was basically invented. So this is uh, uh, 97, a preprint. Uh, and his idea was to really use, uh, to, to get a physical system that sort of had some really nice uh, properties with respect to uh, how errors would occur on them. Okay, and that's the, what I want to spend the first part of this, this talk talking about. So he answers this question really with, can we answer it with some real physical system that uh, is not like sort of the, the algorithmic approach that uh, Daniel described in the first tutorial. Okay, so here's what Kataya's model is. Uh, here's a torus, a donut up in the left-hand corner, and uh, we have some square lattice on this torus, and we're going to put qubits on the links of... of of this lattice, so these blue dots are qubits. And we can also do this model not on a torus, but we'll just do it on the torus for now, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about getting rid of that. 
Uh, and then uh, Kataev defined the following sets of operators. So he defined plaque operators, which we can associate with the plaque, so one of the squares here, and then vertex operators, which we can uh, associate with the vertices of this lattice. Okay, and he defined these four qubit operator, operators, which are the, the plaque operators, uh, which I've devoted up here, and the vertex operators. Okay, and these are four qubit operators operating on these qubits. Uh, and the plaque operators act as all Z on uh, the plaque, on the qubit surrounding this plaque. And the vertex operators operate as X sensor X sensor X sensor X on the vertex, on all the qubits surrounding the vertex. Okay, so this is a set of operators defined on this, 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 this lattice of qubits that's on a donut. Uh, and uh, and uh, the interesting thing about all these operators is that they all commute with each other. Now, obviously, plaque operators commute with plaque operators because they only contain the same types of terms, Z, right? So Z on a qubit commutes with Z on a qubit. But uh, also, and most interesting, the vertex and plaque operators commute with each other. Uh, so for example, here we have a, a plaque operator and a vertex operator, and they overlap in two places, right? There'll be two qubits where they overlap. And since ZZ commutes with XX, that means these operators will commute with each other. Okay, so these are a set of operators. So far I've just defined a set of operators. These are going to be uh, the stabilizer generators, these plaque operators uh, and vertex operators for a particular type of code. But even before getting to that, we can start with, you know, so I said some magic words. I said all commute with each other. Whenever we say the word all commute with each other, the next words are always so we can simultaneously diagonalize them. Uh, and usually when we're talking about that, we're talking about that in the context of a Hamiltonian. And indeed, this is the, the interesting sort of setup. Uh, we can talk about uh, this uh, a particular Hamiltonian on this toric lattice, okay? So it has some coupling strength, which we just call J. And then it's just a sum over all the plaque operators and a sum over all the vertex operators, okay? Okay, well, each of these uh, vertex operators and plaque operators are stabilizer generators. They uh, square to identity. So we, they each have eigenvalues which are plus or minus one. Okay, so we can simultaneously diagonalize all of them. And when we do that, we end up with, you know, a set of eigenvalues for each of these operators. So in other words, uh, we can talk about the, uh, the different states in this Hamiltonian. We can block diagonalize it uh, with respect to these eigenvalues, right, given different values of S sub P and S sub V on each of these states. So the simplest thing is just let's talk about the ground state. So the ground state has all of the uh, S sub P operators as plus one, right, because each of these is just going to contribute as some nice scalar into the, the Hamiltonian. The same with the vertex operators, they'll all be plus one. I put a minus out here. So all of those, all of these contribute uh, a minus J amount of energy to the ground state energy, okay? Okay, so, so, so this is, you know, and, and we can talk about, well, what if one of these was minus one? If one of these was minus one, that would change the energy here, right? It would flip it up by a factor of 2j. Okay, so this is a Hamiltonian. All these commute. We have these vertex and plaque operators. Um, and what's nice is you can now sort of say, uh, so, so I haven't told you anything really interesting about that. I also haven't told you that the ground state is unique at all, right? So all I've said is it's clear that because you're just summing over all these different terms, which are either plus or minus one, the lowest energy state is going to be the one where it's all plus, right? But there might be multiple ones. But you can also talk, even before you begin to talk about that, you can talk about sort of what do excitations above that ground state look like. Okay, so in particular, we can talk about what happens if I do an X error, a poly X error, on a particular link here. Okay, well, that X error will commute with all of the vertex operators, right, in particular the ones above and below it, because those are all X's. Those are the vertex operators have all X's, uh, right? Uh, but it will anti-commute with uh, the two plaque operators. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means if, if we have a stabilizer operator and an error that anti-commutes with it, then that changes the value of uh, the eigenvalue. So in other words, after this error, right, uh, you'll, ha you'll have an, still have an eigenstate. If we say we started with an eigenstate of, of uh, let's say we started in the ground state, or one of the ground states if there are multiple ones, and then an X error occurred, right, then that will flip the value of these two plaque operators and will change them from plus one to minus one, okay? And another particular thing is that that will cause an energy excitation, right, which is 4J above the ground state because we flip from plus to minus and flip to plus to minus here, so that's two factors of 2J, okay? So you create an excitation and uh, it sort of has these, these 
two minuses are the indication that that, that has occurred. Okay, so more generally, if you start thinking about this, you can start constructing strings of errors, and you'll start noticing, so you start playing around with this, and you start noticing what happens when you create these errors. Uh, and in particular, what you notice is that the excitations, uh, right, so we have this ground state, and the excitations are, are going to be things that live at the, the end of chains on the dual lattice. So in particular, if you look closely at this, at this one up here, Right, so if you look at it, you see that uh, it starts on this plaque here, moves to this plaque, moves to this plaque, moves down, moves down, moves over, moves down, moves down. Now on a plaque like this one right here, right, there are two X errors. So that commutes with ZZ, so it doesn't violate this plaque operator. It only violates the ones at the ends of, of this error chain. Okay, so you have an error chain, uh, and at the end of it, you've violated, you know, you have these two free ends, and uh, this, this configuration meaning I reach this from the ground state, cost me 4J energy. Okay, there's a similar story for Z errors, but now uh, the Z errors live on, on, actually on the lattice itself, right? So if I draw sort of a line here, right, the Z errors live on. But again, it's at the end of these lines where you have these uh, uh, excitations, and in fact, what we should really think about is that these are, are pairs of, of particles, right? So they're at the end of these air chains, and they're a gap above the ground state. Okay, so now you can start doing things if you really want to think about these since they sort of have, you know, sort of this, you're violating at the end of these strings uh, and they look a lot like uh, things that are particles, you might ask questions like what if you take one of these particles and braid it around another one? If they're of the same type and you do that, meaning if you have a, a set of X errors and you braid a set of X errors around that, meaning you take it and move it around, so this is kind of a hard to see, but you take this and move it around. If this was an all X error, though it would live on a different part of the lattice, right, then that commutes, right? So in other words, these things are, are bosons with respect, to, with respect to moving them around each other. But if you take a, one of these uh, two types here, with these X type particles and these Z type particles, and you move this around here, then uh, you will acquire a phase of minus one, okay? And uh, so there's a bunch of different ways to see that. I, I won't discuss exactly how to do that, but what this is, is this is uh, some sort of an example of a, of a particle that is uh, a boson with respect in some sense, right? Uh, I mean, a fermion with respect to going around the other. Okay, so that's kind of a weird property to have, but Okay, uh, and in particular, this is the sign, this fact that we end up doing this, of the fact that there's actually a degeneracy in this ground state. Okay, so, so, uh, uh, so if you take a particle, let's say uh, an X particle, and remember on the torus, right, so that means we're in the game where if you go off this side of the map, you come up on this side of the map, and if you go up this side of the map, you come off this side of the map, right, and if we take these particles and braid them, uh, take them and move them, right, so create a string of X errors that goes all the way around and then reconnects again, and then we can sort of fuse them together by just continuing that error, right, then this produces some operation which doesn't commute, so this operation, like the one I've drawn here, commutes with all the stabilizer operators. It doesn't have those dangling ends anymore. Similarly, there's a, an operation which goes in the other direction, sort of, right, with Z operations on the lattice itself, okay, and uh, if you apply these operations, right, uh, and they commute with all these S elements. These were stabilizer generators, so this is something that is a logical operation on our ground state. So in other words, there's an encoded, we can think about an encoded uh, X operation as being one of these operators which wraps uh, around, the, around the torus in this direction and then Z in this direction. Now, there's also another set of, there's also, that's just one qubit. There's actually two qubits because I could have gone in the other direction. Right, so here's X2 and Z2. So these are my logical operators for uh, a stabilizer code. And uh, what we now know, right, is from, from just the basic theory of stabilizer, there's no way to, so the important thing to check that they're logical is not just they commute, but there's no way to take, right, so why are they logical operators? Well, uh, right, you want to make sure that there's no way to take these, uh, uh, take the, uh, let's see, it would be the vertex operators, I guess, because my vertexes had, had X's. I always get confused which one I had, right? And uh, there's no way to take that and actually create a bunch of vertex operators, right? Those always form closed loops that aren't, uh, that can be contracted down to a loop, right? So if I go back, I didn't say this here, but let's see, where's a good picture? Right, if I take one of these errors like this and I complete it into a loop, right? So if I make a loop of, or actually let me just show the, show the original thing here. <laughs> 
that's the best way to do it. Right, so here's the X errors, right? So these are these plaques. So the X errors are thought of as, right, or I mean this, this vertex operator is thought as a chain which starts here, goes here, goes down, and goes over, and then goes up, right? So it's a closed loop. This, this, this chain, right? So the vertex operator, these closed loops that we can shrink to a point, the operators that I gave you up here do not have that property, right? They go around, the, they wrap around the torus, so we can't contract them down. Uh, and so therefore, these are our, our logical operators for our qubits. Okay, so this allows us to sort of talk about some topological perfection, right? So if we take this, this Hamiltonian that Kataev gave us, uh, there's two encoded qubits, right? So that means that ground state will be full fold degenerate. The Hamiltonian itself doesn't involve the logical operator, it just involves the stabilizer operators, right? So we'll have a full fold degenerate ground state, and then we'll have a gap between this ground state and the excited state, okay? Now what's nice about this is this allows us to have some sort of protection uh, in the following sense. Let's suppose we take some single qubit and two qubit operations and we'll just turn on some you know, sort of constant perturbing interaction on this system. Well, in order, for, uh, in order for the ground state, so let's say we start in one of these ground states, or in a ground state, doesn't matter, we're in some superposition of it, but we're entirely in the ground state. Uh, and then we so, sort of say, well, okay, what's the matrix element for uh, you know, us to go from, say, this state to this state? Okay, so if we have different states here, we want to know, you know what the, the matrix element under this perturbation is to go between here and here. But of course, what happens is uh, in order to go from here to here, you have to do a logical operator. So a logical operator requires creating these two particles, pulling them across, so sort of hopping on a bunch of different states up here, and then eventually going back here. But in, in particular, it requires a very long air chain in order to cause that operation. Right, so this ground state is, is topologically protected in that if you have really large airs, right, uh, uh, they don't have any matrix elements that connect ground states, okay? Now how big are, the, how big could those airs be? Well, you know, the air, first air that actually does something non-trivial is one that wraps all the way around uh, one of the edges, one of the lengths of the torus, okay? So uh, something like on the order of L, Right, the, the sort of length of this lattice is the, is the first operator that you get which contributes non-zero amplitude for mixing this ground state. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, okay, well, so if we think about our back to our perturbation, we take this perturbation, we introduce it, we turn it on, and then we say, well, what happens? Well, uh, you know, on, up to, uh, you know, mth order here, we get zeros, right? And it's only after we get chains that go all the way around the entire thing that we get some non-zero element between these two, and this, this level spinning begins to, uh, begins to show up. Okay, so if this is really a perturbation, this is actually getting, you know, very, very small. Okay, so this is sort of the idea of, of topological protection. Okay, so in some sense, uh, you're using this fact that you have some very long air that you need, uh, and, uh, and uh, then we have this ground state which is protected. Okay, so there are some, you know, some questions about this, which is sort of going to motivate me into to what I want to talk about and uh, the, what I'll talk about for different types of codes and things. Um, so the first question is, okay, so we have this gap. If we keep the temperature very low, right, so there might be this possibility that we actually create excitations here and they wander around and kill our system. But if we keep the temperature very low, then if we encode the information in this ground state via some magical mechanism that I haven't discussed, uh, right, then this system will be topologically robust to a perturbation. So if I have some perturbing environment, it won't be able to gain access to these, to these transitions. Okay. Now there are a couple questions. One is, okay, is this realistic? The other question is, uh, how do we perform gates? on this type of, of encoded information, right? So we have this ground state, now we don't want to perform some greats, gates, right? So to perform some logical gates, in this case they're not very interesting, they're just encoded X and Z operations, right? What we really need to do is create, uh, you know, a pair these two particles and then wrap them around one of the lengths of the, of the, of the torus and re-annihilate them to produce this, you know, XXXXX uh, operation. Right, and the, the interesting question about this is can you do this manipulation fault tolerantly? Okay, so in other words, uh, using the, you know, sort of fault tolerantly in the way that uh, Daniel described it previously. Okay, so there is a way to use topological error correction to do something fault tolerantly, and this is to actually sort of throw away that Hamiltonian model and just think about this as a code. 
okay? So we can think about topological error correction, uh, and it has some very nice properties. Uh, we don't get, you know, we don't have this physical system that does that, but we can do things which are fault tolerant uh, via sort of, you know, a, a traditional quantum error correcting code approach, right? This is just a quantum error correcting code. So, you know, what happens is errors occur, uh, so, for instance, you know, you have some, some set of errors that's occurred, and uh, it's a string of X's, and then it'll be violating these two plaque operators. So when we measure the syndrome, right, we'll see these two red spots. And then you'd like to fix that, right? And, but, of course, you don't know where these errors occurred. But uh, what you do is, I mean, there are a lot of different procedures to do it. In this case, we sort of just have two here, so, uh, you know, these might be very close on the lattice, and it might be a huge lattice, so if they're very close, we sort of match them up. And this is the details that are found down here. But, you know, you can imagine that there's a fairly good way of taking close errors and matching them up. And so you might actually apply this chain to fix it. Now, what's nice about this is, is the result of this, of this operation, if your error rates or errors are not occurring too fast and you're sort of doing a, a not too naive uh, way of, 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 you know, matching up these pairs of particles to get them together, right? Like if they were very close together, you wouldn't want an algorithm that, you know, applied the thing that wrapped all the way around like that, right? So if you're in that sort of regime, what, what you do is you've applied something which is, you know, one of these loops which is contractible to zero. So in other words, you applied something from the stabilizer, okay? And so you therefore have not created an error on the encoded information in the, in the, in the toric code. Okay, so, so this is a method for doing topological quantum error correction and you can uh, go through and you can do something, at least you can do sort of the basics of fault tolerance uh, uh, for things like operations, for ver some very simple operations. Uh, and this has been analyzed in these papers here, okay? But what I'm more interested in is, or what I think is a more interesting question is what can you do that's fault tolerant, can you do fault tolerant ga gates in this more Hamilto Hamiltonian-like model? Okay, so to explain sort of what I mean by that, I want to give you three examples uh, which I think are interesting to think about uh, for the entire conference in terms of thinking about, uh, you know, uh, these different ways that we achieve storage of classical information. Okay, so these are messages, these are, these are ways of storing classical information, uh, and uh, they're just toy models. They're not meant to be particularly sophisticated, but they give you some ideas of the types of, of models that you might see and sort of their fault tolerance properties. And these are all classical, and one of the goals, I think, of, of quantum error correction is to do quantum versions of these. Okay, so these are going to be the uh, ferromagnetic IC models in one dimension, two dimension, and then a thing called Tombs Rule, uh, which is a two-dimensional uh, cellular automata, and we're going to make that cellular automata noisy. Okay, so this is two and greater dimensions. Okay, so the ferromagnetic IC model, for those of you uh, who may be coming from more of a computer science background, uh, is just the following. You have a set of spins. Uh, and here I'm going to put them on a two-dimensional lattice or on a one-dimensional chain here. Uh, and each of these has a spin, which is a, either up or down, and we'll label that by plus one and minus one. Uh, and then for each configuration, so right here I have a particular configuration, so the spin's pointing up and down, there's going to be a, an energy, okay? And that energy is going to be a sum over uh, uh, two different terms. This is going to be the most important one. Um, Okay, so what this is, is, is this is an S, I, S, J, and then it's sum over neighbors. So particularly, for example, for, for this link here, there's a term in this Hamiltonian which is negative if they are aligned, right? If they're both plus or both minus, then this gives you a negative J, and J is greater than zero. And if they're anti-aligned, pointing in different directions, right, then uh, this will give you a positive contribution to the energy, okay? So this is, this is the... Uh, uh, two spin interaction. So between every neighbor in here, you have a, a contribution to this. You sum those all up and you get the energy. There's also another term, which is the, the external magnetic field, which I'll just need a little bit later. Uh, this one will most of the time be setting equal to zero. And it's just a sum over all of the spins, right, whether, you know, they're plus or minus. So if they're all pointing up, right, this is just, it's H times the number of spins. Okay, and we're going to do this in one and two dimensions, and in one dimension, of course, what's happening is you're connecting these two and these two, and right here you have more general, you know, your couplings are all between nearest neighbors, but on a, on a two-dimensional lattice. Okay, so now we need to, let's, okay, so of course, why am I considering this? Well, because this is a cartoon map of our hard drive, at least this one is, right, which is that we store things in magnetic domains, okay, and these spins are, in some sense, storing the information that's, uh, you know, that I'm using to give this talk, right, and, uh, 
and that you know what we're going to do is we want to talk about encoding into what the majority of the spins are voting. Are they voting up or are they voting down? Okay. But we need some dynamics on this to talk about like sort of an error model, right? So if I go in and I look in my hard drive, of course, you know, I have a bit in there which is encoded, which, you know, gave the grade of one of my students last week. And, uh, you know, I assign them a, a 2.8. And, you know, uh, we don't want that to flip to, uh, uh, you know, a 2.9. Uh, we don't want to give them that 0.1 grade, right? So we're trying to protect our information. And, uh, and, uh, you know, if we look at that magnetic domain, what we'll actually see is that at, you know, non-zero temperature, what happens is that there's an environment, and the environment likes to come along and flip the spin, right? Okay, so this is, you know, very similar to what occurs in decoherence, right? It's a noise model, and noise comes in and does something to our system, and we'd like to prevent that. Okay, so uh, sort of pseudo-realistic model of, of how that might go is, is some sort of dynamic icing model. One way to do is just use the Metropolis update, which is the idea is that uh, you sort of go through and think about an environment coming along randomly and picking sites and deciding whether to flip them or not. And what it decides to do is it decides to flip a spin. If, it, if the spin would, would uh, it decrease the energy, meaning cool it down, then it does it. Okay, and then that energy sort of gets, you know, dissipated out away. Uh, and if, if it would actually increase the energy, uh, then it does flip it, but with a probability which is e to the minus beta, which is 1 over the temperature, uh, times that energy change. Okay, and this is just the Metropolis update. So we can define dynamics on this, on this icing model, right? This is the two-dimensional one. We can do it on the one-dimensional one. You go along and you look at the spin here and you see, you know, whether flipping it would increase or decrease energy. In this case, it would increase it, right? So you increase it with a you flip it with this probability here, which depends on the temperature. Okay, so as the temperature goes to zero, uh, right, as the temperature goes to zero, uh, you never do this. Okay, so that's the, that's the model that I want to have for, for the ferromagnetic IC model uh, and its dynamics and sort of noise on it. The other model that I want to talk about is Tomb's rule. Okay, so this is a two-dimensional noisy cellular automata. Uh, and it has the following, so a cellular automata, we have a bunch of, uh, in this case, it's just bits on a square lattice here, and there's an update rule, okay? And what this update rule is, is, it's, is as follows. To update the side of the cell at the next time step, you look to the north, you look to the east, and you look at yourself, and then you take the majority of those, okay? So, for instance, if I took, let's see if I can hold my hand steady, one, zero, and one, in the next time step, that would stay one because the majority are one. Okay, so this is, this, is the t this is the tombs rule update. And you can see why this, this update sort of does something interesting, which is suppose you have a sea of zeros and you stick a, a, some flip, flipped ones in here. So somebody comes along and flips them to one, and then you start updating this. Okay, and let's assume no more errors sort of occur. Well, then what happens is, you know, you look at, uh, you know, this one right here, it has a zero and a zero, so it will change to a zero. This one has a zero and a one, so it will stay at one. Right? And this one will also stay at one, and all the other zeros will, will stay zero. This one you look one, you look here, there are more zeros, so you stay zero. Right? And so it sort of shrinks this set of ones, and in fact it shrinks it, you know, to the right, and then the next step it shrinks it down, and then eventually it gets rid of it. Okay? So, for the model I want to consider is this is sort of uh, internal dynamics for fixing errors. Right? Uh, and, uh, but what I also want is I'm going to do a cellular automata rule where I have an update rule like this, and then with some probability I flip errors. Okay, so that's another set of dynamics on, on this is a cellular automata. So this is a random uh, cellular automata. Uh, and of course we want to see, you know, at some point if we flip too many, we're going to lose information that we encode across all of these. Okay, so of, like I said it, sort of briefly when I was introducing this, our idea, the idea is we want to talk about encoding information, this place just classical information, into these two physical systems and then into this uh, particular cellular automata. And, uh, and, uh, and what we're using is just a redundancy code, right? You take a spin up and, or spin down and repeat it across the entire lattice as spin down, and then you turn on the dynamics and see what happens, okay? So the order parameter, the parameter showing us whether the information is still there after some time later, is just the total magnetization, right? It's the, it's the, it's the sum, or this is the... I, I, divided by the number of spins, right? But the sum over all the spins, whether they're mostly pointing up or mostly pointing down, right? So if this is zero, it means that you have half up and half spinning down, and you can't really tell sort of where you came from, right? Okay, so, so we want to compare these three models in terms of their robust properties for storing and manipulating information. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's take a first approach on this. What if we just took StatMec, and what do we know from StatMec? Well, we don't know anything about Tombs Rule, probably, because at least my StatMec did cover Tombs Rule. Uh, but, uh, but sort of our standard approach is, you know, if we talk about long-time behavior, not infinite, but effectively infinite, uh, you know, what happens is for the 1D icing and the 2D icings, we see very different uh, effects, right, which is that for long time behavior for the icing model, except at exactly zero temperature, uh, uh, the magnetization, you know, decays away to zero, okay, meaning that if you started it all and spin up, then, you know, uh, this M is, you know, been averaged, you know, sort of way, and we no longer know where we came from, right, whereas for the two-dimensional icing model, there's a critical temperature, and below that temperature, right, we have these two, uh, sort of stable regions here. Uh, now, in the fully infinite limit, we need to worry about whether these actually go to M, but in a very, very long time, what, gen what happens is we sort of have this bifurcation, meaning that if we had information that was mostly up here, you know, it mostly stays up there in the long time limit. Okay, and Tomb's rule actually looks just like the two-dimensional IC. Okay, so, okay, so this is one way to think about storing information. Now, of course, uh, there are some bad things here. One is thermodynamic limit taken. I've gone to, like, long, I've gone to sort of infinite size systems. Uh, and also, I haven't really talked about that time. I've just said after a very long time, you know, this is what occurs. Uh, you know, and for practical purposes, that may not be what's important, right? It may just be that is the time really long. Okay, so let's look at sort of a more sophisticated version of this. Let's ask what happens if we, say, prepare our system at some, uh, uh, let's say we pre prepare them all spin up, and then let it decay away, right? And what will happen in the one-dimensional IC, it'll decay to M equals zero. And what will happen is that this decay rate will become uh, sort of exponentially suppressed as we get below the gap energy, which is this how much it costs to flip, right? That's this J here. Uh, and so as we get to lower and lower temperatures, as we go to lower and lower temperatures, this will get slower and slower and slower. In particular, below that gap energy, this becomes, right, slower and slower, and we're getting exponential benefit by getting closer and closer here. Okay, so we can sort of think that if we wanted to store information, it's good to do this. We just have to get to really low temperatures, right, because as long as this decay is really, really slow, we're fine. There's a similar model going on in the two-dimensional icing. Uh, uh, what happens there is there's a critical slowdown. Uh, so you sort of get out here, you're sort of getting slower and slower and slower, and then it decays away such that, you know, we get really slow sort of at this, at this critical temperature. And then, you know, in this lower region, we don't really care too much because we're relaxing to states which, are, which still retain the information. So it doesn't really matter that it takes too long there. Okay, so this is sort of a more sophisticated model, and we sort of see this isn't so bad. Okay. Well, what, what happens if, say, we do something like imperfect preparation? Okay, so if we do imperfect preparation, let's say we, that means we don't start with all the spins up, you know, 25% of the spins decided to point down. Okay, so we start here, and the same sort of thing occurs here, but what's nice about the two-dimensional versus the one-dimensional IC model here is that we see that, you know, if we were, if we were down here uh, and we imperfectly prepared things, then it actually relaxes back up to this line. In some sense, it, you know, goes to a higher magnetization. In other words, it, it really fixes the information for you, right? So this is an example, in some sense, of, of, of the system actually doing error correction. Here, you're just, you know, you're starting at a worse M, and you decay away, right? But here, you actually relax back to something that's better, okay? So you're doing a fast, in fact, you know, if you're way below the critical temperature, then it's actually a fast relaxation back to this ordered state. Okay, so if you have imperfect pre preparation, then, then this is what happens. And this should start giving you some idea, you know, some sense about fault tolerance, right, which is really all about if we have imperfect preparation, if we have imperfect uh, manipulation, et cetera. Okay, so now let's do some computation on this and see if anything changes. So for, uh, you know, a big domain of spins, the most interesting computation you're going to get to do is to flip the spins, right? So you have them all pointing up or mostly pointing up, you want to point them all down, right? Okay, so... Uh, so what happens is, is, you know, so there's sort of this long time decay because uh, in the one-dimensional IC model, but then you flip all of them, right? But it still just continues to decay in between these flips, right? So, you know, as you're flipping, and also what could happen here is, notice I tried to draw this, it was a, a cartoon, but this is decaying, and then you flip it, and you might not flip all of your spins correctly, right? Some percentage of your flip 
your spins may, you know, you may have errors in doing them. So you actually don't end up all the way back symmetric over here, but down a little bit, right? And it just gets worse and worse and worse. In particular, you know, if you're losing 5% every time you flip it, then those will just add up. You'll get 5%, 10%, right? I mean, 5% each time, right? So you'll just continually decay away your information, and you're, you're not doing anything remotely fault tolerant in flipping your spins. Now, for the IC model and Tomb's rule, the, the story is exactly the same uh, when you're above the critical temperature, but it becomes very different when you're below the critical temperature. In particular, you know, you, you're, you're at this nice, good magnetization, and then you flip all your spins. Now, you miss some, right? But what happens is it'll decay back to uh, this higher value of M. Right? And as long as you're not doing the operations too fast and too poorly, right, you'll never sort of, uh, you'll never sort of end up, you know, you'll go over here and you'll relax back. You go over here, you'll relax back, and you'll continue to do this. In some system, the system will self-correct itself. Okay. So in the one-dimensional, so the lessons from all this, in the one-dimensional icing, uh, you really want the temperature to be smaller than the gap just to store information. Uh, but manipulation also has to be really uh, high fidelity if you want this to actually do some long computation. If not, it just sort of decays away from flipping these spins. In the two-dimensional icing model, something completely different happens. And in Tomb's rule, right, if you're below the critical temperature, then, uh, then you don't really have to be quite as careful. You can have imperfect uh, operations, perfect pre preparation, and it will sort of self-correct itself. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, this is, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the standard textbook picture of, of why there is this order in two dimensions and not one dimension. So think about you start your one-dimensional system and all spin up, so you're in the A state. Now you flip one of these spins. That violates these two energy constraints, right? So now it costs you uh, 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 2J in energy, so you go up in energy. But now you can flip its neighbor. Right, at no cost in energy, so you can create these two excitations, move them, and continue on in doing this, and it only costs you, uh, you know, sort of this 2J to create this pair, and then you went across, and then you, you know, uh, drop back down, and you totally destroyed your information, okay? So, so the energy to air in this model is constant, and the reason why your thermodynamics works out the way it does is because uh, the disordering entropy, meaning sort of the states that are right above this, is uh, right above this ground state, is much greater than uh, than the energy. Okay, so uh, so what happens in 2D? Well, of course, we know sort of what happens is if we flip one spin, it now violates these four bonds, right? So it costs us uh, 8J in energy. And now we have, when we flip, say, a neighbor, right, we, we cost even more energy, right? And uh, so we have to go up even more. In particular, you know, to sort of create uh, an entire flipping, we need to flip spins which are like the length scale of, the, you know, the cost and energy, which is like the length scale of this lattice. Okay, so in this case what happens is the energy uh, cost is much, much greater than the disordering entropy, and so that's sort of why these things are, 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 are good thermodynamically, right? If an error occurs like this, what's likely to happen in our Metropolis update, right, is that it's likely to do this, right? It's likely to shrink down. Uh, there's some probability that goes to a bigger error. Right, but that's suppressed because it costs more energy, right? So you can sort of see there's a natural dynamics going on there. Okay, so just one more comment, which I think is also perhaps relevant to thinking about fault tolerance, is uh, Tomb's rule, actually, so I've introduced it, but everything I've said has been the same as the two-dimensional icing model. Um, but there is a nice, interesting, uh, uh, interesting sort of uh, uh, effect, which, which is, uh, which is, distinguishes it from the two-dimensional icing. And that is, in particular, if you have sort of a, a non-zero magnetic field, so I have some non-zero magnetic field, and I look at the thermodynamics of the, of the IC model, right? What I end up having is only at H equals zero do I have these sort of two coexisting phases. So I sort of have these two, this bifurcation. Away from that, the system actually sort of decays away to M equals zero. Now, you know, as you approach H going to zero, right, the, the time scale to do that becomes very long. But what's interesting in the Tomb's rule is, and in Tomb's rule, what H corresponds to, because it's a cellular automata, right, it actually corresponds to some bias in flipping your, 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 so what I've assumed before is you just have a probability of flipping the spin, but we might have mo a more probability to flip zero to one than one to zero, and that's what an H corresponds to. And in Tomb's rule, what happens is there's actually an entire region of, of this space of H and, and sort of temperature, which is the air, which is related to the air rate, where you have these two coexisting phases. 
Uh, and if you ever run into Charlie Bennett, you should ask him about that because he's done some, he did some very interesting work on that uh, prior to doing his quantum stuff. Okay, so back to the quantum world. So that's sort of a, a classical motivating example of storing information in physical systems, right? Uh, and Kataya's original motivation, or at least part of the motivation, right, was to sort of see, can you do this, right? Uh, and so we have this Hamiltonian, and, uh, you know, we have some robust storage. We argued that if we were at low temperature, right, uh, we wouldn't get any actual, actual excitations of the, of the uh, out-of-the-ground state, and perturbation theory can't connect those things. So we should be able to store information in there for a long, long time. Now, that's good, but the question is, let's say we wanted to do fault-tolerant operations, right? So what does that mean? Well, that means, in this case, doing something like creating those particles, you know, wrapping them around and then annihilating them uh, on the other side of the, of the, you know, as we've gone around the torus, right? But when we're doing that, we have to think about, well, what's the physical model for doing that? And it might be that, you know, we can actually create these particles and control them nicely, and uh, we don't actually create any other particles or anything when we do that, but there's a real possibility that when we're doing this, we actually create errors in that process. And so when we're trying to do this whole flip, we might accidentally create a pair of excitations. And those pair of excitations can then just randomly wander around the lattice, and they will eventually disorder the system. Okay. So, uh, so while this Hamiltonian is nice for sort of the memory, the memory parts, right? For fault tolerant manipulation, it's not quite what we're exactly what we're looking for. Okay. So this leads to, I think, what is one of the most interesting questions, and hopefully we'll hear something about this. Is it possible? Is it possible to construct a Hamiltonian which allows for fault tolerant manipulation as well? Now we already know the answer to that, actually, uh, in some sense. Now we don't have a full universal set on this ex particular example, but it turns out if you look at the four dimensional model of version of the, of the Toric code model. Okay, so uh, we have these now plaque and vertex operators, but now we're working, you know, on a, on a, on a cubic four-dimensional lattice, which I can't draw, let alone even imagine, uh, right? Uh, and, uh, and it turns out that, so in, in, you know, we have these things where we had our particles uh, that were the ends of these strings of errors. Uh, in this higher dimensional one, what happens is we get, uh, we get these excitations which have energies which, like in the two-dimensional icing, right, depend on a perimeter of, of, the, of the, air, the set of errors you've done. So in other words, this model uh, is, is, should be self-correcting uh, in the sense that it should be just like the icing model in that, you know, it'd be very hard to create these big errors. And when you're trying to do a logical operation, you know, you have to create these big errors to do this whole thing. But if you happen to make mistakes along the way, these mistakes will tend to correct themselves. Okay, so, so this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the fourth dimension thing. Now, the open, real open important question is can you do this in three-dimensional systems, three spatial dimensions instead of four dimensions? Um, okay, and uh, for references, this, is, this paper down here is the one you should be looking at. So, Dennis Kataev, Landau, Preskill. Okay, I'm going to skip that. Okay, so, uh, so this is the, the Kataev code, 97 is a long time ago, but it's a motivating example of all sorts of different related ideas, which I'll just briefly talk about, because uh, I don't have nearly the time to talk about them in any depth, uh, which go under the moniker of topological quantum computation. Uh, and the idea here is, you know, it's very, very similar. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to create these particles, which are anions. Now, the ones in Kataev's theory which were, were actually kind of boring. They didn't do anything except multiply this minus one when you braided one around the other. But uh, in general, you can have non-abelian anions, which when you take one of them and braid it around the other, so you have these two particles, and, or we have one here and we braid it around this one, that operation will actually cause a unitary action on the ground state of your system. So you have a topological code-like system, same sort of setup, and now you create these different particles, so we create a bunch of them down here, and then we take them and we braid them around each other. Okay, so here's a braiding those two, and then I braided those two, and I braided those two, times running up on my diagram here. Uh, and then I, okay, so those braidings actually on the ground state, what they do is they uh, actually enact some unitary gates. Okay, and then after I do these gates, I annihilate the system. You know, I, re I take these particles and I try to fuse them back together. And depending on what I see, what types of particles I produce, basically, when I do that, I actually, that corresponds to some measurement on my system. 
Okay, and this is the basic idea of topological quantum computation. Again, what's nice about it, right, is, is we have this degenerate ground state, right, so it's very hard for an environment just sitting by itself to do anything to it, right? Uh, we can create these particles, and then we can, you know, to do gates, we just keep them far apart, and then we braid one around the other and move it back. The real question is, can we do those operations fault tolerantly? In moving a particle, can we actually move it without creating any other uh, uh, real excitations in doing that, okay? But uh, this is uh, an entire set of, of, of slides, that uh, a set of uh, results that I don't have nearly enough time to talk about, but just to give you an idea, uh, these types of states, of, uh, so these types of physical systems that have ground states which uh, have excitations which are non-abelian uh, anions are thought to exist, in particular uh, in fractional quantum Hall effect systems, uh, there are sort of two states that are, are uh, thought to possess uh, non-abelian anions, and there's, uh, you know, experimental work on trying to actually show that this is true. Uh, this one right here turns out to not allow universal quantum computation. So, you know, in this model, what you're doing is you're taking these and you're braiding them past each other, right? And when you braid them past each other, you implement a unitary operation, and your question is, is that a universal set of quantum gates? Okay, so this one's not, but there are ways to sort of, uh, you know, try to boost up, boost your way up, and uh, in particular this work by uh, Sergei Bravi. Uh, and then there's another state which may also be non-abelian anions and is actually universal. And then there's a bunch of models, so you should search for these three people in particular to get a host of different models that have been proposed uh, that if you could build them, then they would support uh, topological phases. Okay, and in particular another sort of development that I think is interesting that hopefully we'll hear about about our color codes, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll hear that about that in this talk. And then, of course, the, there's also the question of implementing all of these ideas in different physical systems, like optical lattices and superconducting circuits, right? And how do you actually do that? And you know, do you maintain all of the properties that you're supposed to when you do that? And in particular, I think these two talks will discuss sort of implementations of these types of ideas. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, the, the Hollywood sensors got to me. Okay, so uh, let's see, how much time do I have here? Okay. Uh, okay, so so we can talk about, so Kataev's model is in the right sort of direction. Now what I want to talk about is actually subsystem codes, and I'm going to motivate it via sort of some small scale examples of trying to do things like Kataev, uh, and sort of build them up into something which eventually gives us a subsystem code for quantum error correction which has interesting properties. Okay, so here's sort of the, the first uh, small scale example I want to talk about. Uh, and this comes from uh, uh, thinking about decoherence-free qubits. So those decoherence-free qubits for collective decoherence, remember if you took four of them, you could get a decoherence-free subspace, and it was this J equals zero, these two ways to make a total spin zero state, okay? So if you turn on a Hamiltonian which has uh, exchange couplings between all four qubits, not very realistic, uh, but let's talk about doing that, then you get a Hamiltonian which is basically the total angular momentum squared. Okay, so the ground state is going to be the zero, in this case because the angular momentum, there are four spin one-half particles, so they have spin zero, uh, uh, one, right, et cetera, right, so they're integers, so the zero one is going to have zero here, it's going to be the lowest state, uh, and uh, 0, 1, and 2, right? So uh, uh, this is going to have 0, and then there's going to be uh, excitation at 1, et cetera. And this ground state will be that decoherence-free qubit that uh, Lorenzo was talking about. Uh, and, uh, and so I skipped that just because Lorenzo did it. So in, in particular, the spectrum of this is you have a gap, right, and then a slightly larger gap up to the S equals 2 state. And down here you have uh, this D, the DFS, right? But what's also nice about this DFS is, as was mentioned, these are examples of quantum error correcting codes, really, right? In fact, this isn't an error correcting code, it's an error detecting code. So what I mean by that is any single qubit operation, so for an error detecting code, I'll just do it here, any single qubit operation will take you out of this ground state. So in particular, say I took the first qubit and I applied the operation S1 plus, okay? So the operation which goes from, say, zero to one. Okay, well that will cause uh, the system to get excited out of this ground state. That's not too different than if I just had a bare qubit with two, two energy levels and I had something that excited it out. So I had zero and one and I excited it out. It cost me some energy, right? Okay, that's not too different. But what's interesting is because this ground state's an error detecting code, any error, in particular things that if you had two energy levels, 
and they were, uh, right, and there was like a zero and a one, and then you had a phase error, meaning that you had a, a, a Z error, right, which is what like Daniel talked about, then that would normally be a non-dissipated one in the sense that it wouldn't change the energy of this, right? It just sort of corresponds to, uh, right, it just sort of corresponds to uh, applying phase to this state relative to this state right here. Well, it turns out that because this is error detecting, you must also get excited out of this ground state. So there'll always be a cost. So in particular, you'll always have a constant cost for any single qubit error, okay? And that's like Kataya's model, but a very small scale version because it's only for single qubit errors, whereas Kataya's for errors that go all the way around this lattice. So I should give you some sort of like first order effects. Okay, so that's a small scale example, something that you might think about actually is more pra is practical. Um, but let's try something even simpler. Let's take the classical icing model in two dimensions and just make it quantum by turning, instead of having ZZ interactions, so aligning along the Z direction, let's do them along competing directions, okay? So X, X direction, okay? So I have four qubits, I have the following Hamiltonian, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, right? X1, X3, X2, X4. So there's my Hamiltonian. And what's nice about this is there's actually a quantum error detecting code in this state. So if I define the following code, my stabilizer generators are S1 and S2, are all Zs or all Xs on these four qubits. Then I, if I do that, I have two, uh, uh, two uh, encoded operations. One is the on the first qubit, which operates like Z1, Z2, and uh, X can then be Z1, Z3, and similarly I'll have encoded operations for the other qubit. So you're encoding two qubits into four, and this is an error detecting code. Error detecting code means any single qubit operation anti-commutes with uh, at least one of these with one of those two, okay? Uh, but what's nice about this is if you look at this, 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 this stabilizer is actually a symmetry of this Hamiltonian, right? If I take S1 and S2, it actually commutes with this because this has four X's, so it'll anti-commute with something like ZZ because uh, there are two Z's and two X's operating on those qubits, right? Okay, so these stabilizers commute with it. That means we can block diagonalize it, right? We say commute, we mean uh, simultaneously diagonalize, right? So, uh, so in particular, we can write the Hamiltonian in the following form. We can write it as minus Z1, so that's uh, Z1 is this one, two term. That's this I term here. And then plus S1 times Z1, Z2, so that's this Z, Z term down here. Okay, so I can write it like this, and then I can simultaneously diagonalize these stabilizer operators are either plus one or minus one, right? And notice what's nice already is that the H doesn't depend on the second qubit, right? So there's no second qubit in here. So in particular, if you, you know, assign the values of plus and minus one to the different stabilizer operators, there are four possibilities. For each of those, the Hamiltonian will look slightly different, right? And we can calculate what the eigenvalues are because these are just simple operations. This is just a Hadamard, right? And we find that the, the ground state is going to be the one in which you have uh, both pluses for S1 and S2, okay? So the ground state of this system is the all plus one eigen sta uh, eigenspace of the stabilizer, and it's twofold degenerate, that twofold degeneracy corresponding to the fact that this Hamiltonian doesn't include that second logical qubit, right? Uh, and this is the spectrum, and there's a gap of, you know, minus two minus, uh, or minus two plus two square root of two, right, between these two, so there's some energy gap here. But as I said, this is an error detecting code. Any single qubit qubit operation must take you out of the code space. Okay, so in particular, for example, uh, so it, that's just what this says, right? If you do something like the Z error on the first qubit, right, then it excites you out of this ground state in the following way. Okay, and every single single qubit operation does this on this system. Okay, so this is exactly like the, uh, like I was talking about before, uh, um, for, for sort of the, the exchange interaction, but now we have this, uh, uh, this, this, you know, sort of quantum version of the IC model. Okay, so motivated by that, you could start thinking, I think I have a picture on the next page, or maybe it's not, it's further down. You can start thinking about what happens when you do this instead of a two by two system, what happens when you go to a three by three system and try to construct a similar Hamiltonian where you have ZZ couplings along one direction and XX couplings around the other. And in doing that, you can come up with a, an example of, uh, of a subsystem code where you can do subsystem error correction. So I don't have to spend too much time on this because Lorenza spent uh, a good time covering it. Uh, so, you know, the ge most general way we can encode information that we know of into a, into a quantum system is to encode it into not a subspace, but a subsystem. The most uh, uh, simple example, right, is if we have two qubits 
right? And, uh, and we can just encode information into one of the qubits, and if we put an umbrella over that one, which I know a lot about in Seattle, uh, you know, this one down here gets rained on and we don't really care, right? I don't care if it's raining in Los Angeles, I really don't. So, uh, uh, so you know, the most general way we can encode things is to encode into subsystems. In particular, we can take a subspace, take a subspace and then put a subsystem on that subspace, okay? So we can encode information into say the first sub, the subsystem here, uh, and then the second subsystem here we don't care about, and this is the orthogonal space where we also don't care what happens about. Okay, good. Okay, so, uh, so in general we do that, right? Uh, um, okay, so we, the most general notion is doing that. So if we're going to do error correction, right, what we really care about is not that, uh, you know, not that we go from this and that it stays the same, right? We don't care what happens to this. So the most general error recovery procedure, we can have pretty much anything occur on here, in particular things like non-unital errors can occur on here. So there's a, a very elegant theory that I won't have time to cover uh, that talks about sort of general settings like this, but the most important thing is that if we have subsystems around that we don't care about, we can let them be error. Okay, so in my remaining few seconds here, let me talk about uh, uh, sort of an example of a, uh, of, a silly, of a stabilizer code. Okay, so I'm going to start with a really simple stabilizer code. It has four generators on nine qubits, which I've laid out on a grid. It has these double lines of X's and these double lines of Z's going down. And then because I have four stabilizers, I'll have five logical operators. One choice of those operators are all of these little two qubit ones, and then these guys down here, which actually are very large. And it seems like these are kind of bad, right? Because we know that, uh, you know, if, if we have logical errors which only have weight two, right, I can enact that by doing a weight two error, right? So when you first look at this code, you go, well, that's silly, right? Why would I do that? Because, you know, if I do something on the system, then uh, I just immediately store the information in X1. But that's the key, right? If you do something on X1 and all you care about is X5, who cares, right? Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, and Montreal, I don't care, Seattle's fine, okay? So uh, if I do that, I can think about, you know, if I take my stabilizer, I can think about those five encoded qubits, and I'm gonna stick my information up here in H5, and uh, I don't care what happens to, to, to all of the other, you know, subsystems over here. Now, of course, I do care if I get leaked out of this, Right? I care if I move to another subspace, which is not, say, the all plus one, but I don't care about, you know, what happens to those other subsystems. So let me just quickly run through a very quick example of how this might work. So let's suppose you have an error, like this microwave up here. In particular, we'll have a Z error on the central, central qubit. Okay, so we have these four stabilizers, and we're going to measure them. So before the error, they, let's say we encode it into the all plus one subsystem. Okay, so we encoded information into this last subsystem. We initialize these in some way we don't care about. Okay, so before we were all plus one. Okay, so we're in that particular subspace. Now when an error occurs, that anti-commutes with, you know, this operator and this operator. So it flips these two direction, right? We come along, an error occurs, and now we fix it, and we fix it only modulo, not doing anything to those other qubits. Okay, and that's subsystem error correction. And since I'm running short on time, uh, I will just tell you that you can develop that in uh, uh, some uh, interesting ways. And in particular, I just want to point to there, there will be a talk uh, about some subsystems codes later on. So this should give you at least some idea about what that talk is. Uh, and there's a lot more work that I have to skip over here. The final thing I'll say is that actually that Interestingly, that, uh, that subsystem code actually has some very interesting fault tolerant properties uh, where uh, you, you basically can get away with attaching uh, fewer ancillas when you're doing fault tolerance syndrome measurements. I don't have time to cover that, but uh, it's also an interesting property. Okay, the final conclusion is, okay, well, we have these compass models, uh, you know, uh, does this actually provide a robust, stable memory, like the Kataev type code at least? And the answer is uh, no as far as we know. So here's the result of some simulations in 2005, sort of simulating the gap of this, sum, uh, this system as a function of, of L. So the one to look at is probably this one up here, the triangles, right? And it, it looks as if the gap in this system is actually uh, shrinking exponentially as a function of the size of the lattice. Okay, so it doesn't look like it's gapped. And there are good reasons to believe that's true. Okay, and I'll stop there. Uh, these were the three things I, I think that are interesting that I hopefully you got some idea about. Uh, topological protection, uh, uh, toy models to sort of think about is there a way to get physics to do error correction with you, and then the notion of subsystem codes.
And that's everything, so thank you very much. You might have to do something, or you might have to do something much more traditionally fault tolerant, right? So, uh, I mean, there's a question about how do you build, right? So, for instance, in the spin model, what we normally do is we think about spinning them, flipping them all at once, right? And those are all little independent things. But there are other ways to think about doing that, which is to sort of flip uh, small islands and join them together, right? And so, you know, probably it will have to look more like that because of the way in which we know about, you know, that's sort of one of the differences in quantum fault tolerance. At least it looks that way. Thank you.